So, in a very short time, as spring approached and the big Freedom Congress in July that summer, the organization was filled with people who were either help clears or on their way to being help clears or were making help clears, and the place was like, you never, I tell you, if you never had the experience of being in a fairly large group of people who were help clears, I want to say you haven't lived, you have lived, but it was glorious. And uh, everywhere you went, I mean, uh, other people, ordinary people could feel it, and your presence as a help clear was in itself uh, therapeutic to the world, to people. And uh, the way uh, people looked at the organization at that time, and the PCs and the clears and... It was amazing. In my experience, which lasted up until 1980, I have never seen a state of clear, or even OT, uh, so-called OT, uh, from the L rundowns or what have you, um, that even approached what a help clear looked like and felt like. So, that was one of the simple things that just about anybody could learn to do for another person. You didn't have to be, you know, like, oh, no, it's a very simple procedure. Um, I still use it whenever I want to clear someone. And it can be done. Sometimes you don't have to do all those steps and they'll just stop mocking up. You know, that's the big clear cognition. I'm not mocking up anything. Well, you... There was nothing to mock up, really. So, that was one of the highest points for me personally, for health, intelligence, understanding, ability, blah, 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 blah. And it was one of the landmarks in the 1950s. And um, Ron, with the help of uh, John, John Galusha and um, John Sanborn, ran that as an experimental process and made clears in the organization that winter before we ever touched a member of the public. There were about four or six people that... And, oh, prior to that, two other names that should be noted as famous were Don Breeding and Joe Walsh, uh, who were both 1950 people, and they were both electronic whiz kids. And um, sometime in the winter of 57, 58, Ron said, we got to get a new e-meter for this clearing procedure because the old meters were about that big and you plugged them into the wall so there was a danger of being electrocuted. And they had more dials and junk connected with them than you could imagine because they were made before transistors existed. So Ron got Joe Walsh and Don Breeding into his office, and me too, and said, I want you to design a very compact, simple ohm or e-meter that measures ohms of resistance using a transistorized wheat bridge or circuit, okay? And that has degrees of sensitivity with the number of ohms of resistance it can measure and so forth. And we're going to calibrate it to clear both male and female. And... I want it in a small metal container with a face on it and some dot things you turn. Can you do it? A couple weeks later, they presented the existing circuits and they also acquired a, a simple small lithium, cadmium lithium battery. And um, then they had a simple metal case, and Ron said, let's make it blue with a kind of a uh, seashell look to it. He looked at me and said, you're in charge of ordering the materials for Joe and Don, who will assemble everything, okay, and uh, we'll test them and get going, you guys. So in no time at all, we were baking the paint on in the oven at 1810 19th Street Northwest. People would walk in to that building and say, what is that smell? 
MFC, while we're cooking some paint in the oven. Don't let it bother you too much. So that's how the little blue meter in the metal case, the first transistorized meter, was born. And it was a joy to behold. You could drop it. And it didn't plug into um, the mains. And um, it was a great a meter to give you a sense of what was happening with your PC when you were running the clear procedure. So that was a lot of fun and uh, we had them ready for the Congress. I, I don't remember what they cost but it was not very much and um, well I got a big kick out of that. It was It was really beautiful and I'll stop now. Thank you. All right, so we've been talking about 1958 clear. Uh, someone might ask the question, well, was that permanent? Did it last forever? Did it persist till the end of time? No, it did not. Like everything else in the universe, it changes. Um, keep in mind that uh, beings or human beings are living with a body that is in itself a stimulus response a reactive creation and if it weren't it wouldn't survive the day the body is not a uh, an entity without stimulus response I mean if you throw something coming at my eye I don't have to think close your eye that eye will close because the body is a stimulus response carbon oxygen engine running at 98.6 and uh, is, is supposed to be that way. You're not supposed to have to... Oh, let's see, there's a car coming at me. I wonder if I should get out of the way. Well, I'll call someone up and ask. No, 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 you don't have to. Body's eyes see the car, they'll... Okay? So, one of the things that uh, has an effect on states of consciousness is that you're living with a reactive mind called a body. And as time goes by, you might like to spend a lot of time with it and duplicate it. And if to the degree you duplicate it, then you're being a reactive mind also. But the other thing is, um, having just gotten rid of, by keeping it from going away, holding it still, keeping it a little more solid, you got rid of those things. Now you're saying, but the state of clear, I must have it every day. I paid for it and I want it to to continue and it mustn't ever change, forget it. If you wake up spiritually, you'll see that that isn't the way the universe works. You got a new car, you put it in the time stream, you drive it out the, the dealers, next thing you know it's called a used car, and then a year later it doesn't look the way it did when you first got it. Well, that is true of states of consciousness too. They don't look the same a year later. But you will retain two things. The ability to rehabilitate that state, get it back again. And two, the things that you gained in it, the understandings and things, many of them will remain with you probably for the rest of this lifetime. Yeah, that's why auditing training is so great. All of that stuff is practically forever. It isn't like I got blown out. Now, auditing training, wow. But the idea that everybody has to be an auditor, <coughs> no, you don't have to be anything. In fact, uh, being nothing is a good idea.